Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 32 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. Learn more about the forum online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis and moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Libby Larson is one of America's most prolific and frequently performed living composers. Born in Wilmington, Delaware, she moved with her family to Minneapolis at the age of three. She graduated from Southwest High School and earned her BA, MA, and PhD in music composition from the University of Minnesota under the tutelage of Dominic Argento, Eric Stokes, and Paul Fettler. She was named a composer in residence with the Minnesota Orchestra, achieving the distinction of being the first woman to serve as a resident composer with a major orchestra. Her catalog of over 500 works ranges from intimate vocal and chamber music to orchestral works and opera, and her music has been sought after for commissions and premieres by major artists, ensembles, and orchestras around the world. She is co-founder of the American Composers Forum, which nurtures the creative spirit of living composers and provides services, support, and information to more than 600 active composers. Today, she will offer a glimpse into the mind of the composer in a presentation entitled, What You Hear Is What You Get, a composer on composing. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Dr. Libby Larson. It is a true pleasure and a deep honor to be with you for this hour uh, that we're on earth together at the moment. Um, I'd like to thank the Westminster Town Hall Forum for the invitation to speak with you today, uh, and also the League heirs of the Junior League of Minneapolis for the sponsorship of this talk. It's really most gracious and most appreciated. Also, I want to thank my two wonderfully talented friends, soprano Laura Hines, and pianist Grace Choi, who have just given us a brilliant performance of my song set, Try Me, Good King, the last words of the wives of Henry VIII. Brilliant, and I thank you so much. Well, I stand here before you as a living American composer. Oftentimes, uh, when I introduce myself this way, especially at orchestral concerts, I get a laugh. <laughs> yes. uh, and, and I find it uh, extraordinary uh, that in a world so full of classical music, uh, we composers who are making new works uh, for the concert hall um, are uh, always uh, amazed when we step out in front of an audience uh, and we understand that so many people who love music so dearly don't know us who are, who are living and working among them. Uh, and, and so I'm here to tell you we are generous and lovely people and we're everywhere. <laughs> uh, I am a composer and I've been writing music since I was a child. Since the 1970s, I've been working professionally uh, with orchestras and opera companies and choruses and choral societies and soloists and chamber musicians and recording companies and publishing companies and all manner of nonprofit organizations who are involved with music in this country. It is a wide and strong network of uh, people who absolutely love music and are so very curious about where does it come from. I'm pointing to my head, for those of you in the radio audience, because, of course, it comes from the minds of composers. I'm proud to call Minnesota my home, and I'm proud to number among my dearest friends the many, many musicians who've invested their talent and passion and lives and the lives of their families in our community. We must treasure our musicians with all we can. Now, music. <laughs> Music is a mediated art form. As our plays, 
as are so many art forms, but music in particular is mediated because, of course, if someone comes to me and says, we'd like you to write us a string quartet, and will you give it to us in two years? And I say, yes, of course, I'll give it to you in two years. Nobody knows what it sounds like, just me, for, uh, up until the, the premiere of the piece. And so it's a mediated art form, mediated through those who desire to have a piece of music made, those who desire to put on a concert, those who will perform the piece of music, and last but certainly not least, the audience. We have a tremendous amount of music in our community. But I write so much music that I travel extensively all over the country and now uh, quite a bit in Europe and a little bit in Asia uh, lately. Um, in fact, after the talk today, I'm headed down to uh, Baylor University in Texas for the premiere of a work on Saturday evening, and then after that for a week uh, at DePaul University in Indiana for a festival of my music week long. So I travel and I, oh, oh thank you. Um, <laughs> that wasn't an ad, it was my segue to my next uh, point. <laughs> um, that um, uh, wherever I go, I am met by gregarious and curious and engaged people who want to know about composing music, really want to know about it. It seems mysterious, and it is mysterious, because it takes place in the brain. And we can't really say to you, here's what happens. I think of a B flat. And then after the B flat, I think of a C. It's not the way it happens, at least for me. If I am thinking about a piece of music, it arrives full blown in my head. It's just there. And then the work that I do is bringing the piece from inside my head out in a way that you can understand. Uh, 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 that I'm trying to communicate with you. Um, and so I have wonderful conversations with people everywhere I go. Great conversations. Here's a good one. Had a conversation with a lawyer. My life is full of lawyers because my husband Jim is an attorney. Uh, and so I love to go to lawyer parties and see if I can get them to understand music. Um, <laughs> Great conversation with a really fine litigator. We were talking about musical form, and so I said to him, you know, if you studied musical form, you could probably present closing arguments in a different way. <laughs> There's a form called the Rondo form, and that is a form that, that where a piece of music is presented, and then you take an excursion away from it, then you come back and you present the same bit of music, and you can do that forever, ad infinitum. Uh, uh, and, um, and the lawyer said, that's a really interesting idea, and by George, he tried it, and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> well, wherever I go, people ask questions, all kinds of questions, so I thought what we would do is spend some time uh, digging into some of these questions, because it might illum illuminate you a bit as to how we think, we composers. I get a lot of letters from children, lots of them. I brought one along. This one is from Kevin Rene Blanquis. Dear Miss Larson, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Have you written any new compositions? I've always wondering, is music life for you? This summer, I'm going to Minnesota, so maybe I could visit. See you later, Kevin Rene Blanquis. <laughs> Well, I wrote him back and I said, yes, as a matter of fact, music is life for me. It actually is. All of my life goes into the music that I write. Not as a biography, but simply by the fact that I'm alive right now. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment. Another question from kids that comes up all the time, what is your favorite piece you wrote so far? <laughs> and I'm delighted to tell them the one that I'm working on right now right now, because it's so engaging, so activating, so exciting, and you can see their eyes light up. Because what I'm telling them is that the process of engaging your brain and your passion is always the best moment of your creative life. Always. Here's another one they all ask. Do you have a dog? <laughs> yes, I have a dog. His name is Bosley at the moment, but the most famous of our dogs is Dave the Singing Dog who, when I would play C-sharp on the piano, he would just break into operatic singing and howling, <laughs> which is caught on tape and shown in schools quite often. I get questions from older students, meaning everyone from sixth grade to 96. Here's one. What is music? <laughs> Wanting to know. So here's what I answer. 
I think this music is this. It's an order of sound in time and space perceived as music through a particular cultural perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah. That, in fact, the only thing about music that is absolute is pitch. That's the only thing. And everything else is perceived by a culture as to be an order of sound that we can call music. Oh, and we get into marvelous conversations about and around what is music. An order of sound in time and space. Now, I was born in 1950, um, which was a peculiarly interesting time to be born for a kid who hears her way into the world before she smells or tastes or touch her way into the world. Because the air and what's contained in the air has changed tectonically. When I was in my youth, my youth, um, music was mostly acoustic, mostly acoustic. Now, of course, music is mostly mediated through electronics and technology. And the air has changed quite a bit. But I, as a composer, can make an order of sound in time and space in order to communicate what it's like to be alive. And that's my answer to what is composing. You say, what is composing? Making an order of sound in time and space in order to communicate what it's like to be alive right now. And it's quite different being alive right now than it was in Mozart's time, or in Bach's time, or Beethoven's time, or even James Brown's time, who's one of my personal heroes. That means that I can combine electronic sound with cellos. I can ask a singer to sing acoustically, but then turn on a microphone, and she can whisper as loud as she can sing the high C and be heard. It's an extraordinarily flexible and fluid time for sound in our culture. And the composers like myself, who are making orders of sound in time and space, are making pieces that you may not have heard before, because we haven't heard a world like the world that we're in at the moment. Another question. I often get this question. Where does your music come from? And my answer is everywhere. It comes from everywhere. It just comes from being alive. For example, the rhythm of our lives, how we walk, how we move, how we invent our technology to move. An example is a piece that I wrote quite a while ago. It's called Four on the Floor. Um, and it's a piece about, uh, about driving on the freeway and getting in a group of cars and then passing the cars and then passing the cars again, going faster and faster, using your peripheral vision to the point of mm, maybe brinksmanship. But it's a form and a rhythm that our culture has invented, and it's been invented in my lifetime. So I say, OK, that's a form. I'm going to take that form, and I'm going to put music to it. It's mad boogie. But <laughs> it's a mad boogie piece, but it's for the high, most highly skilled orchestral players uh, that, that can be found. So it comes from rhythms of our lives. It comes from the language we speak. I take a lot of rhythmic dictation. Meaning, if I'm with my Aunt BJ, and she is speaking to me, in my mind, I have a line and a music staff, and I'm writing down the rhythms of the way she speaks, which I have books and books full of dictation of the way we speak in our own culture. Feeling that perhaps, if I take the rhythms of the way we speak, and I incorporate them into a piece of abstract music, that you may be able to connect with that music you don't know why. It just feels right just sounds right, comes from the languages we speak, comes from the natural world ideas, from our lakes in Minnesota, from the snow that we know so much about. All of these things are temple and texture and energy. Water music, the symphony I wrote, which is just about being on Minnesota lakes. That's all it is. But oh, does it have variety. Another piece, downwind of roses in Maine. What it's like to stand near a rose hedge in Maine with a bus going by, fuming away, while, while the delicate fragrance of roses breaks through our natural world, an inspiration. The energy of our times is, is an inspiration. Wrote a piece called Collage Boogie. It's a mad boogie piece for full orchestra, 110-piece orchestra. Uh, and, and it's a collage, and it's four minutes long, and it's urban life. That's what it is, urban life. The world as it concerns us, 
pieces about who we are as human beings and how we're trying to relate to each other. A big piece I composed for the Vocal Essence music series, then the Plymouth music series, called Coming Forth in Today, which was a study of tolerance, cultural tolerance, written in 1985 at a time when I really thought that peace in the Mideast was possible. We invent forms to carry our daily lives. Another piece I wrote, Holy Roller, it's played a lot, it's for saxophone and piano. And what I did was I, I listened to evangelical preachers and then I take down their rhythmic dictation uh, and then I made a piece that is an evangelical preacher's sermon for saxophone and piano. <laughs> so, here's a, here's a question that I particularly love. Why do my teeth hurt when I hear modern music? <laughs> this was asked uh, at, at a concert in a question answer uh, uh, session and, and I, I thought, how can I answer that question? Why do my teeth hurt when I hear modern music? And the only thing I could think to say is because you've probably been hearing a certain kind of music. You know, for most of your lifetime, and probably your neurological system has developed in such a way um, that when you hear sounds that don't quite track in that system, that it connects somehow to the nerves in your teeth. <laughs> and here's another one. There are only 12 notes. Hasn't anything, everything been done with them already? I mean, <laughs> that's always a great deal of fun. There are only 12 notes. And of course, the, the answer is not by a long shot. Because of course, music exists in the infinity of what's available in the air. The sound waves that are in the air, connecting, reconnecting, reshaping themselves, and as what is in the air changes, so does the music that's in the air. We have 12 notes in our Western scale, and it feels like everything's been done with them. Not true. I'm writing an opera right now, uh, and what I decided to do was to take pi, which is an infinite number, and then assign a certain pitch class set to it, meaning C is 1 and D is 2, and then I'm creating all the melodies at, uh, uh, in the opera from what is generated by pi. There are only 12 tones there, but they don't sound like major and minor scales. It sounds like pi. It's really interesting. So my time is running short, um, and I think what I'll do is, um, is answer one more question um, that I'm, I'm often asked, and usually by kids. And they say, what made you start composing music? Because it, it is kind of mysterious. Several of my friends are in the audience tonight. We're all nodding at each other. That, oh, yes, it's kind of mysterious. It's in our heads. But here's how it went for, for me. I find a lot, a lot of composers figure out that they're composers around age 11, 12, 13, you begin to discover that this is your best language your best way to communicate who you are in the world is somehow by making music. Somehow that's better than making poetry or making dinner. You make music. Um, and for me it went this way. I was a very gregarious kid. Um, I would say a, a gregarious communicator would be a nice way to put it. And so I was always in trouble for talking out of turn, always in trouble, in school, at home, everywhere. In fact, it went on all the way through my PhD. When the last class I ever took during my doctorate, I got shushed for talking out of turn. Like that. <laughs> so, so I had to learn how to control myself, and it, and it had to start rather young. Um, I went to a really interesting school, which is in Minneapolis. It's now called Carondelet. At the time, in the 1950s, it was called Christ the King uh, School. It's on 50th in York in Minneapolis. And at that point in time, the, uh, the sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet uh, uh, were teaching us. And they taught every one of us in first grade to read and write music. Every one of us. And it wasn't necessarily so we would put on performances. In fact, we didn't start performing until maybe third or fourth grade. It was really a, a logic of, of the disciplined mind. Some people didn't get it at all, but I loved it. I just started writing like crazy. Uh, so I started writing music, and I stopped talking. <laughs> and, uh, and by the time I got to sixth grade, we were studying uh, the new math. 
And, um, and that was con continuous set theory, which I just ate up. I just loved the new math, and I got all involved with it. And then it hit me. It hit me like a meteor that if we could have set whose members are, that set could be pitch, harmony, rhythm, melody, any of the elements of music I could put into my own set. And that would make my own piece of music. And that is exactly what it is, composing, is you know all the elements and you put them together and you compose and you hope, you hope that what you have said communicates what it's like for you, the composer, to, to be alive. All I can tell you is that it has been the most extraordinary life so far. <laughs> I don't know how long I'll be here, uh, but I do know I'll keep, I'll keep musicking first, uh, even if it gets me into trouble for speaking out of turn. Uh, and, um, uh, and so I want to say thank you uh, for, for listening, and I hope you have questions, because I try so hard to illuminate what is, what is in the head of a person who, who hears their way into the world uh, and, and wants to bring to you uh, a representation of what it is for them uh, uh, by giving you a, a piece of music. It's a great sharing of the abstract, essential human emotions, the abstract ones that make us tick as human beings and relate us all to each other. So um, uh, fire away with your questions, and thank you so very much for allowing me to speak with you. Thank you, Libby Larson. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, Senior Minister of Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is composer Libby Larson. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us for our next forum on Thursday, March 14 at noon, when sustainable farming and food advocate Anna Lappe will be our guest speaker. Now, Dr. Larson, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. You have been a trailblazer in many ways in uh, composing in America, and particularly in the role of women. Could you comment on the influence of women in classical music? How has the female voice or mind shaped this genre? Very fine question and one which actually spans about 900 years worth of history, which has only begun to be uncovered in the last 50 years of uh, scholarly research uh, to look for and to find uh, music that is composed by brains who live in female bodies. Uh, <laughs> uh, classical music mm, is somewhat of a marketed uh, idea. Uh, and um, and it, it was brought about, I did a lot of research at the Library of Congress, um, trying to understand where do we get our canon of classical music. Um, and, and we get it from the Victor Red Seal record box that was sent out with gramophones in 1910. And in that box are many wonderful examples of, of music written, classical music, some ethnic musics, what have you. But that box formed what we call the classical music canon. And that box contained no music by women. Um, out between 1910 and today, uh, the, uh, the classical world has grown to include an education system, uh, a recording system, an orchestral system. Uh, and um, if you study the repertoire, it's the Red Seal Box of Records. So, um, what has happened, of course, is we composers who, who uh, have been around now, uh, really since the 1940s, have begun to understand the business that we work in. We are finding ways to introduce new product lines, shall we say, fresh, fresh ideas, fresh music. And among that are, are many, many fine examples of, of many, many women composers. What we're doing is we're, we're supporting each other. Uh, as well as supporting all of the composers who are alive right now. We're really a big community. Uh, and so you're, you're, you're hearing more and more music written by just living composers and, and also, and in particular, by women composers. 
Have you encountered any bias uh, against women in your work? And if so, how have you dealt with that? These are tough questions. Um, <clears throat> yes, I have encountered bias in my work. Um, it usually comes in the form of benign neglect. Uh, uh, and, um, and, uh, and I jo very joyfully uh, try, to, uh, uh, try to change the idea that, um, uh, that, that we just, women aren't there. I've heard conductors say, well, there isn't any really good music to program by women. I've heard that to my face. Uh, and, um, and so it takes a great deal of knowledge and graciousness and a good sense of humor to say, oh, well, here. And I pull out a laundry list of 20 pieces and say, you might want to look at these. You know, and just to try every place where the benign neglect exists to, um, to uh, shed, a bit, uh, shed some light and just say no. You know, the, the, the fact is that there are many of us who are working and it's really fine music. You mentioned our arbitrary 12-tone Western scale. This is from a Southwest student. And as you know, Southwest students, being an alum yourself, yes. you, you, you know how sharp they are. Uh, yes. What ability do we have to appreciate Eastern music or, or music outside 12-tone Western scale? That's a, an excellent question. Um, we have ears. And one of the things I love about portable sound is that our ears become democratic. So we can, we can put our ears on any music that we can put on our iPod today. In my day, it was the transistor radio. But, um, uh, and so it allows us, those of us who hear our way into the world and really are interested in why this note goes with this note, to hear scales from other cultures and to say, wow, that's so different than the 12 notes that I was given in third grade to, to compose music with. I'm going to look into that. And what's happening, of course, is that more and more students of more and more different kinds of scales of what other age are asking each other about the music, seeking out masters you know, of music that is, that is not necessarily Western music, and learning about that music. Uh, and it's enriching the world of music just phenomenally. It's a very exciting world, the world of scales and the way cultures perceive themselves through inventing a musical scale. You described uh, composing as an act of the mind. Uh, many artists speak of their art form as a result of their passions. Uh, can you describe how passion in your life enters into your composing? <laughs> every day in every way. <laughs> uh, uh, if you know me, you know that I will blurt things out from time to time. Uh, and oftentimes, um, uh, uh, it's because I have a very curious mind. Uh, and, um, and I'm very passionate about something that, that takes my mind up. Uh, and so um, what I've learned to do is to just, just run with my passions uh, and then gain enough technical tools and rigor to translate that passion into something that can live beyond my own passion for it. I'm also quite physical. I run around the house. Uh, flinging my arms about and doing opera calls and all kinds of things, just, just to activate the music. This may be a related question from a Southwest student. You use the phrase, mad boogie. Uh, what does that term mean? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, my mother loved and still loves stride boogie piano. Uh, and so um, we often would have recordings from her collection. Uh, on the record player uh, while we were doing dishes. Uh, and, um, and so I would listen, of course, and then I would go to the piano and I would pick out the notes and, and play classical boogie. But then uh, as time has gone on and I've gained other skills and, uh, and techniques as a composer and other uh, uh, encounters with other kinds of music, uh, Elton John, for instance, uh, you know, um, I, uh, I think of boogie as a way of life. Uh, and so when I write, when I use Boogie uh, in, in one of my classical pieces, it will often be quite mad. You, you, you wouldn't necessarily say, oh, she's writing Boogie Woogie. It's just all of a sudden the left hand in the piano part will just break out 
in a, in a boogie riff, uh, and then go right back on into to where it, it is. It makes it difficult for pianists, because they have to <laughs> move from Rachmaninoff to uh, Zez Confrey in, uh, in two measures time and back again. So it's the madness of how it happens. Uh, you mentioned in your talk uh, James Brown as one of your heroes, and in our conversation before the forum, you also threw in Little Richard. Uh, can, can you describe for us the influence on your work as a composer from musicians such as that, uh, rock, funk, jazz, even metal? Yeah, I, uh, yeah I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, because I listen to the, the air, literally, but also the social air, um, I, I've been really, really interested in what music's our own culture has generated, our own culture meaning from 1950 to now, 1940, 1930 to now. Uh, and um, luckily, I come from a family that, that has a diverse interest in music. So Buddy Guy, uh, lots of music of, of lots of areas that weren't considered classical. In fact, when I started my matriculation in college, I didn't have a very good classical repertoire. My repertoire really was uh, uh, boogie and rock and, and, uh, and the current boy bands like Ricky Nelson, things like that. Um, anyway, uh, so, but as time has gone on, and I've, I've been looking for where does music come from in our culture, I, I, I tend to think that it comes from places that are not taught in school, in the academy. Uh, and so I, I analyze every kind of music I can. And James Brown is my hero. He's one of my heroes, as is Chuck Berry, as is Little Richard. But here's why James Brown. We were talking about this. You know, in music, you go one, two, three, four. And in Western music, I'm, I'm conducting as I'm saying this. And in Western music, what happens is we're an ensemble, and I get you ready to come in on one by going, oh, boom, and we come in together and come in. So we hit it precisely, as precisely as we can, on the down, on one, the, what we call the downbeat. Well, James Brown redefined one. It's astounding. He redefined one. So you don't go and a one with James Brown. James Brown will count off, and then everybody takes a breath and goes whoop into the one together, without a conductor, without a drum set. No one's driving them. People are coming in together. And that is a cultural statement. No one tells you when to come in. You just come in together. So I study James Brown, and I studied musicians who know how to move together. Uh, uh, and uh, and it's, it comes into my music, and it drives classical musicians crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what is the role of improvisation in composition for you? This is from a music teacher at Southwest. Oh, thank you, Southwest. Always was a great school. Um, <laughs> uh, I improvise quite a bit, as a matter of fact. Um, at, at the start of my composing sessions, uh, uh, um, I, I go to the piano. I write at the piano, but not on the piano. Uh, I just lay across the piano bench and, and write things down. But to begin the, the session, I, I improvise at the piano. And I, it might go on for five, ten minutes, and I just kind of listen and think, not necessarily to use what is coming from the improvisation, but to free up my brain, to move really fast, so that I can, as I'm improvising, I can hear the music that I'm making, and I can call upon my best critic, which you, uh, you, you really need a good critic, good constructive critic with you as you're, as you're working, and that critic will say, that's bad, don't do that, that's good, you know, and it, and it hones the, uh, my ear and my skills, um, so that then when I just lay down on the bench and start writing, you know, I'm really ready to go. I haven't put a lot of roadblocks uh, in, in the way um, of my thought process. Do composers work together in that sense, critique one another's work and learn from one another, or is it a competitive marketplace? Yes and yes. Um, the, um, I admire writing groups well, where writers will bring what they're working on and read to each other uh, and, um, uh, and critique their work, also painting groups. Composers don't necessarily group around pieces that are being written right at the time they're being written. What we do do is we play our music for each other uh, uh, quite a bit, uh, and, we, and we then very kind of gingerly say, 
hmm, sounds a little long here. It, there's, re there's really not an editing system um, at work in the composition system the, the way there is in um, writing words. So um, we support each other uh, and, uh, and we listen to each other's work. The second part of the question is, is it a competitive world? Uh, yes and no. Um, it certainly isn't competitive to just write music. But because the, the music concert system um, exists the way it does in our country. Uh, it's very hard for composers to be heard on the existing system. So what we do is we get together and we do concerts of our own music. Uh, house concerts, concerts here, concerts there. We just did one last night. Uh, and so we, can be, so we can be heard. So we support each other in lots of ways. A number of questions from uh, young composers trying to start out in the business who are in our audience today. Can you say something about entrepreneurship and, and uh, composer in composing, is, is this a sustainable career? How difficult is it to begin as a composer and make a living from it? It's a difficult uh, road to, to walk, um, and one well worth walking. Um, it, composing is really, for me, it's not a career, it's a profession that's made up of lots of careers, lots of skills. Uh, putting concerts together, uh, trying my hand at record production, uh, uh, it just uh, all the business skills that you need to have uh, uh, to negotiate contracts, to, uh, to promote your work, to uh, archive your work, all the, th all the products of, um, that you produce as a composer, you need to actually know quite a bit about uh, uh, everything around those products. Now, for a young composer, that really seems daunting. But, but a profession is a life's work. So you don't, uh, you don't actually arrive at a career point uh, as a composer. You just work on pieces, piece after piece after piece, and, um, and, and you gather around you um, a group of friends and performers who love your music and want to perform your music. And the way to build a, to build a profession as a composer is to befriend performers you want to work with and be loyal to them. Uh, and, um, and every friend you make as a composer, because they have to believe in what you hear but nobody else hears. So it's a matter of loyalty and trust. Uh, 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 the, the more you can gather people around you who really are honest with you and like the music you write. You don't have to love it, but at least be engaged with it. The more your, your profession grows uh, and, uh, and you understand that you're part of a multi-generational, uh, flow of music, yeah. You began composing in the pre-digital age, and we are in the digital age now. How has that affected you in terms of use of software, or do you compose electronically? How do you see the changing uh, impact on composing uh, with the age of uh, digital music? Well, I wish we had four hours to, to talk about this one. Um, uh, in my lifetime, um, I, I've spanned um, being taught the, the ancient calligraphy of uh, writing music down on the page. That was the one that was invented in the monasteries uh, and is taught to composers uh, uh, really up until we had our first software programs, uh, notational software programs. Um, so I, I'm much, much faster than a computer. Uh, uh, writing my music down, because a computer is very limited in, in what it can do for you as a notational um, instrument. So I just put a 40-stave piece of paper on the, on the bench, and then I just fill everything in. You know, all the notes, everything, uh, in, whether it's loud or soft, all of this staccato marks, it just goes blum, 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 blum down on the page. Whereas computers make you go and pick things out. First you put in the notes, then you put in the dynamics, then you put in the articulation marks, and it's very slow. Um, although it seems efficient, it's, it is not. Uh, and, um, and so as technology has presented us with the possibility of notation by computer as the first approach to the page, um, I, I have uh, maintained what I do and also work with a number of students, private students, um, who I teach to write by hand. 
uh, be because the process of the decision making process is so very different when you when you write by hand. Uh, and so um, we're in the covered wagon stages of technology uh, a as it relates to music. Um, what I fear is that we are so in love with the technology uh, that we throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm worried about cursive writing for the same reason. If you can't read cursive writing, how are you going to do research in the generations before you? you know? And so, so these things are heavy on, heavy on my mind, and I'll stop talking about them at the moment. <laughs> Uh, you, you said that music, a musical piece, comes to you as a whole. And uh, the question is, is that true for longer pieces? And how can you manage all of that information at once? And could you say more about what you mean? It, it comes to you as a whole. Yeah. I know when I was saying it, I thought, uh-oh, I better not say that. But it is true <laughs> that um, um, in my process, we're all different, so engage us after the talk today, because every composer works differently. But in my case, if I am thinking, all right, I'm going to write a string quartet. Uh, this is great. Love strings. And, uh, and I get strings, the sound of strings, at the front of my brain. Um, uh, and I, then I just think. I'm not thinking, and it's going to be four movements, and it's going to, one's going to be fast, and one's going to be slow. I think the shape into being, the shape of the piece. Uh, and, um, and it looks like I'm doing nothing. You know, uh, I, I long distance run, and I, you know, it just, it just looks like I'm doing nothing, but I'm thinking the shape of the piece in. Um, and when it arrives, and it does, it's, it feels like, uh, uh, um, like a kaleidoscope settling. It just, it's there the shape of the piece. Then I start bringing out all of the, of the tools, we call it pitch and rhythm, in, um, in order to fill out the, the shape. Um, and it, it sounds mysterious, but the, it, it's part of the process we don't talk about much. It's called the ceteris paribus, which is part of the, of the brain, which is where the figure arises. And when the figure arises, then you can begin to work. It's true for chefs, true for architects. The figure arises whole and then the work of getting it out of that part of the brain and into a recognizable form is what uh, we call composing. There, there are a number, number of questions related to uh, expanding the constituency of classical music, if you will, and uh, what are the prospects of doing that among young people today who've grown up in, in a genre of music that in many ways is quite different from classical? A corollary question has come in, too. I've, I have a hard time enjoying new music, someone says. I'm stuck on the old classics. What can I do? So two ends of the spectrum there. And both of them quite wonderful to consider. Um, I'm stuck on old music, too. Um, but what I'm stuck on um, is I love acoustic sound. So I, I, so I have a hard time listening to, to techno music. Because I, my brain uh, is wired for acoustic sound. Uh, and um, uh, this is to say to those of you who say, I, it's another question I get. It never comes in the form of a question, but often after a classical concert where I'm the only piece on the concert that is from even 200 years after everything else, um, um, someone will come up and, and um, always very eager to shake a hand, and will shake hands, and they'll say, your piece was was interesting. <laughs> and, that happens with my sermons a lot, yeah. actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, and, and so I always, I've learned to, to, uh, to, uh, to ask the, a question in response and say, oh, what did, you know, not did you like it, didn't you like it, because that doesn't matter. What matters is what did you hear in it? And, um, and quite often the, the, the person will say, you know, I just can't listen to anything past Beethoven. And I understand that. You know, because that's a certain kind of conditioned listening. Uh, uh, and I'll say, well, that's curious, because I can't read any books since Charles Dickens. <laughs> no, I don't say that. I, I don't say that. But, 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 <laughs> but what we do engage in is a discussion of what is melody, you know, and what is the ability to tap your toe. You know, and what notes do you like with each other? And we just sort of do a therapy session on, on, um, on um, how to listen to, to music. And then if I get somewhere, I'll say, you know, I can understand why you wouldn't connect to my piece. Because here's how I use melody. 
No. And here's how, and you know, and it, it's quite like, actually I was on a subway in New York and I heard this clicking and clacking, you know, and that became the, the rhythm. And it's not in 4-4. Four, four. And so I understand, totally understand. It's a question of stretching the ears to listen to the four basic elements of music, always with a new perspective. And those four basic melody uh, 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 elements of music are very simple. How does the composer use pitch? How does the composer use motion? How does the composer use shape? And what is the emotional connection with the piece? In that way, you can think about uh, uh, rap uh, and Brahms in the same concert. And take your ears on a walk in the countryside of sound you know, and discover what is new and different about the pitch that you heard in rap, which makes the pitch you heard in Brahms new and different. Uh, so, uh, so that's my way of answering both questions at one time. Did I do all right? Very well, okay. yes. Nice, <laughs> nicely done. Uh, kind of a follow-up, what do you think the classical composers, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, what were they saying about their lives through their music, and what are you saying about your life through your music? Well, I, I can't answer for Bach and Beethoven and Brahms, but I can guess. You know, um, because they're working with the same elements, pitch, motion, shape, and emotion. And um, the fact is, is that um, all of us are human beings. Uh, and so we move in similar ways, and we experience the traffic patterns of our lives in similar ways, and the social mores of our lives in similar ways. Uh, and, um, uh, and the energy of the time and what people are wearing. It was so very hard to play a tuba if you were a woman in the late 1800s because of your corset. <laughs> the wholeness of what it is to be alive is always found in the music of the composers who were living during that time. And so you will find the wholeness of Beethoven's world, not necessarily what he thought about it, but how he reflected it in the way he shaped his music. It, and we tend to think that we're trying to make some sort of uh, sociological statement um, with the pieces that we write. But the fact is we each listen uniquely. Each person in this room hearing a piece of mine will hear it differently than any other person in the room. So all we composers can do is to give you as much of the shape and pitch and uh, emotion uh, at, um, as we possibly can and let you feel the piece the way it sits on you in your particular life on that particular day at that particular moment. Uh, as a person who speaks regularly in public, uh, which I do as a preacher, I'm well aware of the, the value of silence in a sermon, for instance. In fact, last Sunday's sermon from the pulpit where you're standing was on the importance of silence in our world, and then I went on to speak about it for 20 minutes, and I felt guilty about it. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what can you say about the relationship between silence and music as a composer? Beautiful question. I was thinking um, as we were waiting for the broadcast to begin, our moment of silence was so noisy, so noisy uh, to, to my ears. There was some, some click going on. I don't know if it was typing or something, but it was, it was uh, uh, asymmetrical and kind of interesting, and I was taking it down in my brain. Going, Ooh, that's interesting. Um, um, Silence in our world is the rarest of all birds. Uh, and um, eventually, I think, we'll get around to understanding how polluted our air is with sound. Uh, and in music, there can be no music without silence to judge it, to hear it, if it's silent. And then one note begins to sound. It moves the air. It changes your soul. It focuses your hearing and your thinking. It changes your expectations for what will come next, because now there's a sound. Silence is the thing that is hardest to come by in music. It's taught as rests. Mm -hmm. um, and, and frankly, that is not silence. That's just cessation of a particular set of tempo and gamesmanship with rhythm. But to become truly silent in music um, is 
I don't know if it's impossible. I think, I, think it's, I think it is possible. I think that you can create music just as you can create moments mm -hmm. in your sermons, mm -hmm. you know, where the soul, the body, that has been so drawn into what you're saying has a moment to settle. And then if you let the silence become even more, you move past that fear of being silent, and you move into a place that is very hard to leave, mm -hmm. uh, especially in a world where we're being yanked out of it all the time. Mm -hmm. We had a forum speaker on forgiveness once who argued that for one to be ready to forgive, one must be willing to uh, embrace silence and to stand down from the uh, way you were engaging the world at one point and, and be quiet. And he invited the audience then to into a period of silence for about three minutes, which worked really well on public radio. Uh, so we'll not do that today, but uh, tell us a bit about uh, I'm shifting to a, a different topic, one that you, you and I spoke of before coming in here. We have a number of questions about the current situation with our orchestras in the Twin Cities. And I wonder if you as a composer might comment on, on uh, the situation, the impasse really at both SPCO and the Minnesota Orchestra. Yes, uh, I'll try. Um, uh, because I'm, I'm not an orchestral musician, nor am I uh, an administrator, um, I, I can watch and consider the situation, I think, from a little different perspective. Though I am a performing musician, uh, and I sat on the uh, orchestra lead board of directors for a number of terms, and also the Minnesota Orchestra board of directors for a number of terms. So I think I see the 100-year uh, situation that is currently afoot uh, uh, here in, in the Twin Cities. Um, and, um, it's a, tr it's a tragedy uh, because, uh, because no music is being made. Uh, and, um, and to not hear the music uh, uh, and to only hear about the current business situation of the music is, 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 is really a tragedy. Uh, now, um, will, will it be solved? Yes, it'll be solved one, one way or another. Um, are there sides? In my opinion, there are no sides. It's a huge situation that has gotten out of control. Not with this orchestra, with all orchestras uh, uh, in, uh, in the country. Uh, and, um, and, it's a, it, and it needs to find its new footing, whatever that is. Uh, and Minnesota is the place where I think we're going to find out. We are, after all, pioneers. We love great ideas. We love to see how things play out. After all, we, we did elect Jesse Ventura. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, so I, I, have, I have high hopes that however the situation plays out, it will be played out in, in the Scandinavian collective uh, way we do things here uh, in Minnesota. And if it plays out well, you know, which will probably be long term, then we can be a very strong model for, uh, for really what is about a 100 year problem, which I'd be happy to lecture on anytime you want to hear me, but not today. That's a fine <laughs> note to end on. Thank you, Libby Larson. Thank you.